Hello and welcome to the Truth About Cars podcast. I am Tim Healy, the managing editor for the Truth About Cars. Today we're joined by Cody Stolle, research assistant professor at the University of, of Nebraska Lincoln and the assistant director at the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility. He'll be discussing a study they've done on how the weight of electric vehicles impacts safety. Additionally, Matthew Guy stops by to talk about the NASCAR race at Martinsville, as well as the car ramps he uses at home. But first, eBay Motors is here for the ride. With some elbow grease, fresh and falls, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusions apply. Okay, welcome back to the Truth About Cars podcast. We're talking about the stuff we use in our own homes and our own garages with Matthew Guy, one of our contributors. And Matthew, how are you doing today? Hey, you're doing pretty good, Tim. How about you? I'm doing well, and we need to remind our listeners that eBay Motors is here for the ride with the parts you need at the prices you want and with eBay Guaranteed Fit. They're guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusions apply. All right, so Matthew, can you walk us through car ramps? We're talking about car ramps for the garage today. Yeah, I mean, and it's something that, I mean, car ramps are something that I've always used because I don't live in a spot where the garage is is tall enough to put a, to put in a lift or anything like that, and yet you know this big old noggin on top of my body doesn't really permit me to slide under a car very easily, right? I, mean, I tend to tend to hook my nose on all of the frame rails and everything like that. They say if you put another nose in the back of my head, you can use me for a pickaxe, right? <laughs> so that, so that's why I think it's important. Uh, it helps me, anyways, to get the uh, car up off the ground if I do put it on a set of ramps and. Of course, ramps don't help for when you're changing tires because you're literally driving up on a set of ramps. But I like using ramps for um, oil changes. I uh, used them just the other day when I was diagnosing a cooling problem in my Challenger um, because it allowed the front end to get up a little bit off the ground and just helped me root around in there a little bit easier to find what the actual problem was. So I've been using ramps for decades and uh, we just picked up a, a new set from eBay Motors, and they're very different from the ones that I've used in the past. How so? So these are, um, we would say, composite. I mean, you don't want to say plastic because that has a negative connotation in my brain anyways. And they're more than just plastic, right? They are a, of a composite design. And the ones that I've had in the past have been metal, have been all metal. And they had a pretty, the metal ones had a pretty steep, uh, incline to them. So I had to go and I had to buy some extensions for them so that I would be able to clear the, the lip on the front bumper of the car I had at the time and all that type of stuff. These composite ones, they're from a, uh, from a company called Megan Racing and the, I love the, the, uh, uh, the skew for it. It's called Mr. Ramp. And I, it, it's just, the AMR is just short for Megan Racing, right? But Mr. Ramp sounds absolutely fantastic. And they've got three-ton capacity, so I mean it's enough to even hold up my Challenger, which weighs as much as the Sun. Um, and they raise the car up enough. Once you get up onto them, there is a little bit of a dip. So I always try to have another person with me, at least looking, saying stop. Mm -hmm. Once I once I do get up onto the ramp, but if you're paying attention, you could do it solo because you can feel the car floop into this uh, slightly concave part of these composite ramps. And it makes it easy to know when you're up in the right spot for being on these ramps so that you can set your parking brake and put a chop behind the rear wheel and just work on your car pretty safely. I found them really easy to position. They didn't skid out of the way like my um, metal ones have done sometimes in the past. And what I mean by that is, is once I try to get up onto them, um, they skitter around a little bit. I don't know if there's the composite works better on the concrete garage floor. Um, I do have an epoxy on my garage floor. Maybe that makes a bit of a difference with the composite. And they're wide enough. I mean, I've got, you know, pretty wide tires on the Challenger. And the tires aren't sticking out. It's very safe. So I like them a lot. I like them a lot. Excellent. So before we talk about safety, we got to go over a couple of things here. First of all, it, floop is a highly technical term. It is, isn't and it? Yes, it is. And second of all, it's for Americans, it's composite. 
just you know the Canadian accent is a little bit different. So uh, I think you said composite, composite, something, something like, that. like that. Yes, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Fun, fun with words, right? F- fun with words. We all have different accents. I know I say Dodge funny because I'm from the Midwest. So, you know, I got that little <laughs> bit nasally thing going on. So, uh, yeah. So all, all, all laughter aside, uh, let's talk safety. So no one wants a car to fall on them. So how do you make sure that that doesn't happen with these car ramps? The great thing I feel with car ramps is that you're not jacking up the car with a hydraulic jack. Um, you know, the car is seated on these high strength uh, plastic composite or composite composite right <laughs> yeah okay right the, the car itself is actually bearing all its weight on these ramps so it's not a there, there's no there's no fail points i mean a, a small and it's true a small 10 cent little gasket seal on your hydraulic jack can send everything crashing down and there's none of that mm-hmm. uh, with 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 these types of ramps but I always make sure to put some sort of chalk behind the rear wheels uh, of, uh, of a vehicle that I've got up on the ramp. Just paranoid that it's going to roll back. Um, with these um, ramps and their concave parking spot, for lack of a better term, I know it's not going to do that. It's near impossible. But I still put the chalks back there anyways. And I suppose, I mean, if you wanted to be super, super paranoid about it, you could still put a couple of jack stands underneath the car. But that is something that one could do if they really, really wanted to, for sure. So once you get up there, I mean, make sure your car is in park or in gear, um, depending what type of transmission you have. Set the parking brake. If your parking brake doesn't work, if you've got a hoopty, you know what I mean? Um, use extra chocks behind your behind your wheels. Um, but those are the main safety points that I always see written, and I've always followed over the last God knows how many years of using <laughs> these types. Yeah. So, what are we looking for when you're shopping for these for car ramps? What are you looking for? And also, if, if you've already touched on it, forgive me, but can you sort of walk us through the advantages and disadvantages of composite over over metal? Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean look for um, the weight rating of these things for sure, especially if you if you're going to be working on a pickup truck or a heavier car like my Challenger. Um, you want something that's got a three-ton capacity. I find that that gives you a lot of wiggle room. A lot of these are out there at 2.5 tons, you know, um, and they might be a more attractive price point. Just invest the money, get to three tons. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's something that would be a very smart buy. And the advantages, I immediately found that these types of ramps compared to the metal ones, they they didn't seem to skid around as much when I tried to get up uh, get get the vehicle uh, rolled upon them. And that would be, uh, maybe it's just the way that it interacts with the epoxy that I've got in my garage floor. Um, but it really seemed, I also think there's a bigger contact surface now that I think about it scientifically. Um, because the metal ones, there's really only four corners, right? Really? Right, there's, right. There, right, right. There's just the four, right? There's the two right up front and then two, you know, larger bits, but there's still only two. Uh, towards the back, whereas these um, ones that are not metal, you've got the entire perimeter of each one con- in contact with the floor. So maybe scientifically, if, if if we've got any scientists in our listenership, can chime in later on on social media or something like that. But that's probably why, actually. So that would be my biggest advantage: is just the stability of them whilst you're driving your car around. Cool. Uh, so. Let's talk longevity. Uh, how long would you expect these car ramps to last before you need to buy new ones? And does it make a difference if do metal, does metal last longer than composite or vice versa? Yeah, I don't think these don't seem like they're going to last any you know longer. Sure, I know that you can. It's certainly if you damage your ramps in any way, um, which can happen. The metal ones I've seen them twist up. Not fortunately whilst they're being used, but you know someone. <laughs> this is true. Ran over them. Right, car got away from them, and uh, we were working on derby cars, and we had um, the derby car wired up so you could start it in gear. The person behind the wheel didn't know that it wasn't their derby car, and they just kind of took off, and everyone was fine and everything like that. Right, it was it was just a comical sequence of events, but they ended up running over a bunch of stuff, including the ramps, right, <laughs> that were over <laughs> in the corner. So we just immediately recycled those and got new ones. So if 
something happens to these, uh, whether they're metal or this particular type of material, if there's a chip in them, if you drop something heavy on them, I think you should replace them. But other than that, I mean, they should last for decades. The metal ones that I have have lasted for decades and I've used them. I haven't abused them, but I've certainly certainly used them well. And I expect these uh, made up of the different newer material are going to last equally as long as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, before we wrap our segment, is there anything else we should know about car ramps, whether shopping forum, buying forum, and we talked safety, we talked about composite versus metal, we've talked about all that sort of stuff. Is there anything else that uh, someone who, is, we would go over this almost every week, but someone who's new to do-it-yourself car repair, uh, something they should know before they go shopping for these, or, or even a long-term veteran who just might learn some advice that they haven't known before? Yeah, two two big things for me. One is the total amount of lift that you'll get. Always look at the ads and make sure that they're going to mm -hmm. lift the car up the pro appropriate amount that you want. Okay. And the approach and the approach angle. I mean, if you've got something um, that's a little bit sporty, that's low to the ground, make sure that the approach angle, the angle of the ramp, uh, is low enough that you're not going to drag the front lip on your uh, on your car on your sports car. So look for those two things, and I think you'll be very happy with your purchase. Excellent. Matt, thank you for your time and just in discussing car ramps. And we'll, we will be right back on the Truth About Cars podcast. eBay Motors is here for the ride. And you might have a car that you love the most, like I do. I love my Fox Body Mustang that I once had the most. That car meant a lot to me, even though it's long gone, and I really wish I had kept it going. And if I, uh, perhaps back in the day, if I had known about eBay Motors, I could have kept it running. Because with over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride or die stays running smoothly. With brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Motors guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusion supply. And welcome back to the Truth About Cars podcast. My name is Tim Healy. I'm the managing editor. And I'm here with Cody Stolle, who is a research assistant professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and also the assistant director for Midwest Roadside, for, excuse me, the assistant director for the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility. Cody, how are you doing today? Doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. So before we begin, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself and how did you wind up in your current role? Absolutely. Um, I actually long term aspired to be a pastor like my father. And around my senior year of high school, a uh, man who was going to our church, who's a friend of my dad, offered me a job at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Go be a freshman worker at the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility. And 20 years later, now I'm uh, helping to run this place. Oh, excellent, excellent. So can you explain what it is that you do uh, at your facility and, and what you do in your role? Absolutely. Uh, the, the role of the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility is strictly aligned with saving lives. Um, vehicles leave the roadway and encounter all sorts of features that are located there, um, the most deadly of which have historically been trees, but also utility poles, bridge piers, drop-offs, um, et cetera. You name it, if it's on the side of the road, uh, occupants in those vehicles can be exposed to hazard during impact or encountering those features. And so we help to state departments of transportation to design features for the roadside to make uh, the roadsides more forgiving and safer for those vehicles which encounter that uh, to try to save the lives of those people who are involved in crashes or run off road events without crashes. So we asked you to join the podcast with us because we saw a pretty shocking video from a test that your group put together, which shows the Rivian. Uh, uh, electric vehicle colliding with a guardrail system, the kind of guardrail you might find on pretty much any highway here in America. So can you explain to us this video and the test that you were doing? Certainly. Uh, with some cooperative research with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers Engineering Research and Development Center, we wanted to investigate how existing roadside infrastructure like guardrail um, and other features too, how prepared they are to deal with electric vehicles, which have a little bit different geometry, um, a little bit increased weight with respect to the same size of gasoline power counterparts, um, and then differences in the way that the vehicles are themselves designed and their inertial properties with batteries located in the floor pans and really stiff lower parts of the chassis. 
Um, we wanted to test and see, are we prepared for an upcoming change in the vehicle evolution? Uh, what ended up happening with the, the test with the Rivian was that the pickup truck collided with the guardrail. The guardrail itself ruptured and then the vehicle was able to pass behind the system, ultimately uh, encountering one of our backup safety systems that's just meant to uh, contain a vehicle in the event of a, an accident like that. Um, and we've done a similar test as well with a, a different uh, electric sedan, and we had the vehicle also pass underneath the guardrail system and end up on the backside of the system. That indicated that our roadside infrastructure isn't necessarily ready yet uh, for a full transition to electrical vehicles, but we have the opportunity um, as the vehicle fleet is changing to identify some improvements and, and start to prepare for that. For those listeners who have not seen the video, we will actually have it on on our site at thetruthaboutcars.com. So, you, Cody, you, you already mentioned this a little bit while, while discussing the video, but what was your goal or what was your hypothesis while you worked on the study? The objective of the research study was uh, physically to two part. One, to determine that compatibility uh, between those electric vehicles and the existing infrastructure, and also to build up a knowledge base for computer simulations. Um, crash testing is very expensive. Whereas computer mm -hmm. simulation can be done uh, much more regularly and with different kinds of fixed outcomes. And therefore generating a crash test equivalent is very important so that we can train our computer models to do the same thing and then begin to explore updates and improvements to systems and designs uh, so that we can make sure our systems are better prepared. And then later on down the road, we'll full scale crash test it again and make sure that the design work that we've been doing in the middle uh, was effective. As you've gone through this, how much more does the average a EV weigh compared to the average car from what you've seen? Uh, is it 20%, 50%? What is the number on that? It really does vary with the, the type of the car that you're comparing to. There are some small cars that because the battery packs themselves are pretty small and the range are a little bit less, um, they're only between 10 and 20% heavier. But on the higher end, we're seeing uh, some of these SUVs and pickup trucks um, between 30 and 50 percent heavier than a similar size gasoline counterpart. But um, it's not one hard and fast number. It generally ranges between 20 and 50 percent heavier. What, uh, what, what, if any, recommendations have you found from this study? Uh, first thing first is we are going to have to update our guardrail and anchorage systems. These systems were designed for passenger vehicles, which are quite a bit lighter. Um, and frankly, we were going to have to do that eventually anyway. The weights of gasoline powered cars have been rising steadily for 20 years. And, and these systems were designed back in the 50s, 60s and updated in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and the, the systems have performed exceptionally well. But over time, as vehicles get heavier, the anchorages that, that provide all that tension, that provide that rubber band like effect that capture those vehicles will eventually be pushed to their limits. And that's one of our highest priorities. The second of which is to redesign our rail connections and our rail components so that we have a broader range of captures. Um, EVs are coming out with some very unique geometries, but even then gasoline cars are getting taller and we're gonna have to deal with very low height and very tall vehicles all in one. Um, and that's just gonna require uh, greater strengths, better anchorages and a little bit different connections overall. I'm actually really glad you mentioned that even internal combustion engine vehicles have gotten heavier over the past two, two to three decades because that kind of brings me to my next question. So obviously you were focusing on the weight of, of new EVs as you went through this video, but um, obviously cars have gotten heavier, large trucks have gotten heavier, particularly HD heavy duty pickup trucks. So I would assume then that what you're talking about with the EVs also holds true for internal combustion engine vehicles, as you just kind of said, and, and especially larger ones like H HD trucks or, you know, full-size three-row SUVs, I, I would assume that common sense would suggest that it holds true, right? Yes, I think that's a, it's a fair statement. Right now, um, vehicles that have been getting safer and safer by adding new safety features and increasing in size, you know, we're seeing rollovers deplete, which is great. We're seeing longitudinal crash pulses decrease. That's great. Um, but kind of the contrast to that is what you said, is all vehicles are getting heavier, um, and as they do, you know, existing infrastructure isn't necessarily prepared to handle that. And, and it requires a change that's fairly holistic. 
so okay, we, we, we've been talking about guardrails and that sort of thing, but can you uh, expand a little bit on the weight of EVs if an EV collides with an internal combustion engine vehicle? I mean, obviously, basic physics are basic physics. I think even those of us who struggle with math and science can at least conceptualize that heavier vehicles tend to do a number on less heavy vehicles in a collision. But can you can you kind of walk us through if an EV and an IC collide and the EV is heavier, uh, are there more risks beyond what seems obvious? Well, the probably the best news that I can provide is from standardized testing conducted by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program and the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. These EVs are not generating significantly higher loads during those crash pulses, but they are generating a pretty good amount of safety longitudinal crush. That protects the occupants of, in the EV, but it will also protect the occupants in other vehicles too. Um, okay. This is a pretty substantial advantage of having a frontal trunk or a frunk, um, as well as additional crush space in the front of that car that the electrical engine doesn't occupy that the gasoline engine used to. Um, that, that makes that, sense. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. By extending that pulse, by increasing the amount of time by which that vehicle was slowing to a stop, you actually decrease the amount of force being transferred by the electrical vehicle to the gasoline vehicle and vice versa. And that actually has led to a pretty good amount of safety improvement um, for those vehicles relative to their gasoline powered tight front end compacted compartments. Although all vehicles truly have been getting safer over time. Um, the second thing is we've conducted a limited study of crash data through eight state departments of transportation, looking for all crashes involving battery electric vehicles, and then comparing them to similar types of crashes involving gasoline vehicles and hybrids. To date, <clears throat> we have not seen a significant difference in the injuries or severities of those two crashes, um, and indicating that at least for now, uh, there isn't a very big amplification of safety risk with EVs or gasoline vehicles. We're seeing an overall betterment across the board. Interesting, interesting. And so you, you touched on this just a second ago about all vehicles being safer. But one thing I was thinking of as I asked that previous question uh, is, yes, basic physics is what it is, and heavier is going to do damage to smaller or lighter. But at the same time, all the different safety features we have in today's vehicles mitigate that, right? So. Have you seen that if a larger, heavier vehicle collides with a lighter vehicle, have you seen, this might be a better question for the Insurance Institute, but I was wondering if you've seen this in your own research, have you seen a scenario where, you know, the lighter car, the driver walks away okay because of all the airbags and other, all the other safety, passive and active safety equipment that are on modern vehicles? Uh, I would say that right now, uh, sales data itself may be the greatest form of tempering. Um, mm -hmm. We've been very closely tracking sales data in four electric vehicles to date. Um, it's overwhelmingly in the passenger car sector. There are some SUVs or smaller CUVs um, that are EVs, but uh, sales data is overwhelmingly towards the small to mid-sized car and even in the full-size sedan uh, EV versions. Um, and that means we're not really seeing a lot of those scenarios where the okay. Okay. very large EV pickup trucks and SUVs uh, like the GMC Hummer or the, the new Chevy Silverado EV, um, because there is fewer of those type of size mm -hmm. of vehicles, we're not really seeing a lot of that crash data. So the concern is warranted, but we don't have the data yet to show that that is a problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how how that plays out. You know, would would, would a Hummer versus say a Mini Cooper? You know, would the, would the mini driver really run into trouble, or would all the airbags and that sort of thing, and crash structure and impact structure, all the sort of safety features that are built into, baked into every modern vehicle, sort of help the driver, even if they're much in a much smaller vehicle? So I'd, I'd be curious when that data comes through. Um, moving on to, or kind of circling back actually to the weight of EVs, the heavier weight of most EVs, as well as to a lesser extent, larger, just the growing size of like, internal combustion engine vehicles over the past. 20 to 30 years. Hey, have you seen more damage to our roads, especially in the Midwest? I live in the Midwest as, as you do as well. I'm in, I'm in Chicago, you're in Nebraska. Uh, so, you know, have you seen damage to our roads, more potholes, more that sort of thing? And what about parking structures as well? Um, 
you know, our, our, our parking garage is needing repair more often or, or sooner than they otherwise would because vehicles are heavier, or does it not really make a difference given the way these things are built? Uh, yeah, I think that will also fall into the category of things we need to be very closely attentive to, but thankfully, at least through 2024, we're not seeing it yet. Um, and that falls back under the same problem that we had before. Parking structures are going to continue to struggle as all vehicles get heavier. But right now, the overwhelming sales data for EVs is on the lighter end of that spectrum. So even though EVs are heavier than gasoline counterparts, the cars that people have been buying have been the lighter versions of them. Um, and that means that the same problems that, gas, that uh, parking structures would have with uh, an increased number of very heavy SUVs that are gasoline vehicles. Um, it's simply a continuation of an existing problem rather than an amplification. And the same will be true for roads. This most significant form of road damage actually comes from commercial motor vehicles like big mm -hmm. trucks. Right, um, right. They're, they're quite a bit heavier than gasoline cars uh, and electric vehicles both. Um, but again, it will come down to are these large EVs, if they continue to be sold in high volumes, will that create a problem? It has the potential. Um, and something we'll have to be very cognizant of. Uh, but at least to date, I would say that because of the weights of EVs, the median and 80th percentile weights of sold EVs are still uh, comparable to gasoline equivalents, I would say it's not a huge problem yet. Okay. Okay. And Cody, thanks again for joining us today. I'd like to pick your brain before you, before we let you go about anything else you'd like to share with us as you've worked on this research. Um, overall, our biggest encouragement to everybody is not to panic. We work with some of the best and brightest minds in roadside safety. It is a bit of a niche field, but our job is to save lives. And in the best case scenario, nobody knows we exist uh, because everybody walks away from a crash and is okay. Um, and in an ideal world, we would like to keep people from ever leaving the roadway in the first place. Uh, unfortunately, those forms of autonomy are not yet realized in the world. We're going to get there. Um, in all ways, we just don't want people to panic. Uh, some of the best and brightest minds in engineering are going to make the safety devices ready uh, and available for all people and all types of vehicles. Um, and we thank God for the chance to be in front of it. All right. Excellent. Thank you for your time. So once again, we are with Cody Stolle from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And Cody, we thank you for your time today, and we very much appreciate it. Thanks again for joining us. You bet. Take care. Okay, great. We'll be right back on the Truth About Cars podcast. eBay Motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love. You transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusions apply. Welcome back to the Truth About Cars podcast. And one of our newer initiatives here on this podcast is we're going to we're going to be talking about NASCAR a lot going forward. We'll have Matthew Guy, one of our contributors, as well as a few other folks who follow NASCAR closely, and, and myself discussing NASCAR every week, mostly rumors and controversies and, and and sort of interesting stuff like that, not just straight up race recaps. So, speaking of racing, though, like, like last week, last week we talked about Richmond and what happened there, and we had a second week in a row where there was an overtime finish. This was at Martinsville. And so, so Matthew, walk us through kind of your take on, on what happened at Martinsville and how Hend Hendricks Motorsports finished one, two, three. I believe it was also their 40th anniversary. And um, you also had a take on, on Martinsville racing, short track racing in general that you wanted to share with us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and you're right. I mean, they, they did lead. I find it funny that, uh, and of course, one, two, three is a huge accomplishment. And yes, it's 40th anniversary for, um, for, for Hendrick. Um, and if, if anyone, you know, thinks that this is a conspiracy or if this was scripted, I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult to do that in NASCAR. I think it's hard to script anything with cars going really, really fast. Yes. Right. I mean, I've, I've been watching NASCAR since what, 1991. And there's been an awful lot of really good storylines and sometimes it works out. I mean, you know, 
Davy and Bobby winning on Father's Day, that type of stuff, right? I mean, you know, the Allison family. That you know, so I mean, there's always going to be those those sorts of, especially these days, all sorts of conspiracy theories. But yeah, I mean, Hendrick did uh, do one, two, three. Um, I know there's no podiums in NASCAR, but there's podiums in other uh, mm-hmm. motorsports, and doing one, two, three is a pretty uh, is is pretty. It's, big it deal. still counts as a podium, sure. Why not? It does count as a podium, even though they don't officially do it. They have winners. You can't first, you're last, right? Um, yeah, yeah, Ricky Bobby. Exactly right. That that type that type of attitude. But what what, what was it? It was uh, William Byron. And by the way, may I say, William Byron is fine. But I wish to God he would have gone with like Billy Byron or something like that, right? Just <laughs> alliteration. alliteration. Oh, and it would have yeah. fit the NASCAR vibe so much better instead of William Byron, right? I mean, when I think of William, he sounds Prince, British. Yeah, I, th- I I think of Prince William, right? You know, yeah, uh, which yeah. is not NASCAR. It's just the opposite, no, anyways. It- it, it would be it, like it, European sports cars, yeah. <laughs> but if anyone from Hendrick is listening, and I know you're not, but you know Billy Byron um, got the win, and then that was followed up by Larson, and then Chase Elliott. And I, I think you know the race itself. You know, there, there's definitely room for improvement with NASCAR short track package these days. That's not new. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think NASCAR also realizes that. I think where NASCAR and its fans differ is the urgency for making changes to the short track package with this, you know, next gen car. And it's been what, three years ish. Um, ever since the next gen car was introduced, horsepower was brought down to 670 and it mm-hmm. doesn't lend itself. There have been changes to the body. There have been changes to aero. Um, then it's not mm-hmm. just fans looking for more horsepower. Their drivers are saying the same thing too. So with those sorts of things, in our minds, you think two, I mean, two years ago, William Byron, Billy Byron also, uh, won Martinsville in 2022. And that was also panned as a boring race. Right. So not to suggest that, right. Not to suggest that Billy's only winning boring races, but there are, there are some, there are some parallels along all of the short tracks. Now that we're into year three of the next gen car and more horsepower would fix it. So, Speaking of boring races, one thing I like about short track racing is the attrition. And that's why I find short track racing fascinating is there's more, I don't want to say there's more wrecks because, well, there probably are because, because there's cars that are closer together and there's more pumping and banging than there's a super speedway. But I also feel like, you know, the tracks with a short track, it's easy to catch up to lap traffic or lap traffic. You've got a faster car. So that's why I find short track racing fascinating is the attrition aspect but this this particular race and i i didn't catch the first half of it i caught the final half this particular race didn't have really uh that sort of thing it just mm-hmm. a little more a little more straightforward a little bit more straightforward for sure um and it's still you know i mean it it, it, it is certainly still an accomplishment to to win the grandfather clock at Martinsville, mm-hmm. no matter what you do. Yeah, that, I, I did see that discussion. That was pretty cool, actually. Right? And um, Jimmy Johnson was uh, quietly flexing on social media. Um, yeah. He was giving a tour of all of his. And the, the match won how many? Nine, I think. Is You know, I didn't lot. see the social media post. I just saw what the broadcast was talking about, how the original grandfather clock still belongs to a NASCAR family. Uh, right? Yeah, the daughter of Fire... Of, uh, Fred Lorenzen, I believe, his daughter gave it to a friend, and the friend is the father of a ex driver or something like that. Exactly, exactly, right. And just I find that those, you know, uh, sort of quirks and the grandfather clock at Martinsville so cool. Never mind the hot dogs, right? I mean, Martinsville. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, Martinsville's famous for its hot dogs. Um, but I remember the drivers were saying this time around, you know, the tires didn't wear. Um, and definitely they struggled to pass all day. And once they came out of that cycle, you know, the, the pit stop cycle, I mean, third or fourth, that's kind of where some drivers were, were talking about. That's where they, uh, that's where they tended to stay. Um, and you know, Larson again, in the Hendrick camp, he led something like 90 laps, he had about 80 or 90 laps. And he's in the series lead now, 14 points over Truex, which we talked a lot about who we talked a lot about last week. And he finished down 20th ish. Or something like that. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, we were talking about avoiding boring races. I will say this race at the end, like Richmond the week before, did get interesting. So, like I said, I tuned in a little bit late. I was watching the um, I was watching uh, Women's NCAA Basketball Championship. And I turned in a little bit late to NASCAR. I was going back and forth during commercials, but I really caught the end of, of the NASCAR race. 
And as I as I tuned in, um, one thing I noticed was okay, William Byron's leading with a lap or two left, and you know th- th- this happens a lot. It seems like ever since they instituted the, the overtime rules, whether he's he's leading and the broadcast says, "Well, if there's no caution, he's probably going to get it." And it's almost like a jinx, right? <laughs> and it's like almost as soon as they said that, and it was I believe it was John Hunter Nemechek. Correct me if I'm wrong. Who his brakes essentially caught fire. He he went to hit the brakes and they caught fire. And that burst the tire, and he slid into the wall. His day was done. Uh, he, I don't think he was hurt. I, I, I don't think the car it didn't look like it didn't look like a terrible wreck, but it did. It, you know, any hit to the wall is a hard hit. It looked like it was a decently hard hit. But and they always go to the medical center for evaluation. And the last I heard, he was there. But I don't think it was. It, we've definitely seen worse wrecks in NASCAR. But I digress. So anyway, um, he that happened with I think two laps. Two it was before the white flag because it's before the white flag. Then you get overtime. So he 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 had that happen. He blew his right front tire, and all of a sudden, I'm sure William Byron and his crew are just like, "Oh God, you know, now we're screwed." Because that's an easy. You know, he was he had a comfortable lead. It didn't look like he was going to get passed unless he lost control of his car uh, in those final laps. So you get to that point where you're like, "Oh God, and it's overtime. I could lose this just through bad luck alone." And it makes things a little more interesting. Now, obviously, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy or NASCAR did anything intentionally. You can't script a blown tire from fiery brakes. You just unless you put a bomb on it, which would be ridiculous. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm being facetious. Obviously, don't anyone think take that seriously. But um, that's the one thing that makes NASCAR, even with a boring race, interesting. Whether you like overtime or not, I know some pure people, particularly older folks, who are a little more purist, just feel like, hey, you know, if you're leading the race and a caution gets thrown near the end, well, you won the race, right? You were already leading. You shouldn't be the victim of bad luck. And then, but then the flip side of that coin is, well, the race should end with the cars at speed fighting it out. And too bad if you're leading the race and some bad luck happens. It gives another guy a shot. It's more entertaining, more interesting, and can prevent someone from running away with the race if something does happen. So I will say that's a long way of saying philosophically I'm generally okay with the overtime stuff. I mean, it's – I'd rather it just didn't happen. I'd rather that the race ended under green, but stuff happens. I think we can swear in this podcast, but I'm not going to just to be safe. Uh, okay. Stuff happens. And so, you know, it, it did make the race more interesting, even if it was up to that point, kind of boring. And you're right. I mean, and stuff does happen, right? In NASCAR. I mean, there's still human beings behind the wheel, right? I mean, these yeah. drivers want to win. They wouldn't be at this And, and stuff of, breaks, this, right? And stuff does break, right? What yeah. I thought was funny was that you had the, the, the three boys from Hendrick up front, right? You had the 24 and the 9 and the 5. And there was some contact between the 24 and the 9 close to the end, right? With the 5 in close pursuit. Mm-hmm. And you know Mr. Hendrick was watching the broadcast because he wasn't at the track. He was recovering. Yeah, he had surgery. surgery. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, and um, Gordon was there, uh, representing mm-hmm. representing Team Hendrick. I saw Jeff was interviewed after the race. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but you know, Mr. Hendrick was like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> take worried that they take each other out because if you, if any of our listeners are long-time fans of NASCAR, you'll remember back in 2012, 2013, 20, no, it was 2012, um, at Martinsville, Gordon and Johnson took each other out. I don't water. remember that. Uh, they that wrecked, was one of they, the years I wasn't paying close attention. They were up front, and um, if I remember correctly, it was Clinton Boyer, who was also in the mix at the time. And Johnson and... Um, Gordon, when they were in the 24 and 48, just got into each other. They were up front, and now suddenly they're not up front anymore, right? In the cloud of smoke. So I could totally see Mr. Hendrick yelling at his television from wherever perch he was at, <laughs> watching the race, saying, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. And yeah. I think that's why you didn't see the extra aggression. I do think Chase could have been very aggressive and won that race, um, but I think that might be in the back of his mind not to do so. Um, yeah, absolutely. And- Right, and cause, and that's just a pro- that's just a product of team racing and a product of Hendrick Motorsports too. Hendrick is a pretty buttoned up organization; they always have been. And yeah, yeah, good for them. I mean, they've got all kinds of success. So that's, yeah, you know, 
And, and plus two, Mr. Hendricks, 74 years old, right? You don't want to give a man a heart attack at this stage of the game. No, no, no. He's don't. accomplished a lot in his life, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you're talking about the race being boring. I'm trying to avoid just recapping the race because everyone can do that on, on highlights. But we're talking about the race from a more big picture perspective. One thing that I that I found uh, with short track racing in general, not just Martinsville, it, it kind of goes back to what I was just saying with the overtime. So maybe the racing itself was a little boring, but the brakes blowing up it was not. And the thing about short track short track racing is it's hard on brakes, right? You know, mm-hmm. you're going to be on the brakes a lot, and that's probably why Nemechek. And I say blowing up, I'm exaggerating a little. It didn't literally explode. It definitely overheated, and mm-hmm. I think there was a little bit of flame. And from what I saw, it looks like the flame may have caused the tire to puncture. So, and it's not un- uncommon to see glowing rotors during a race and it's not uncommon to occasionally see a fire from brakes they get really 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 hot during that kind of racing i said that many reallys for a reason um you know it, it, i think that is the one thing about short track racing that i find interesting too is and it goes back to what i was saying a few minutes ago it's the attrition thing right so it's even if the racing is a little bit boring and drivers dominating there's not a ton of passing or a lot of the passing is farther back in the pack that's not affecting the lead there's also with with short track racing there's probably in some ways more chance of equipment failure and that i'm not i'm not 100 certain on that and i think i think all tracks have their own ways of damaging the cars you need super speedways you're running the car at high rpm at, at full throttle a lot what well, you know and you're not using the brakes a ton and that can cause damage in a certain way if you you know over every engine or whatever uh, road courses are going to also be hard on brakes and going to be hard on tires and suspension. So I think all different types of tracks have their own effects on the vehicles. But I think in short track racing, especially, it's kind of interesting to see how how hard uh, the brakes are worked and also how hard the drivers are worked. One thing I do remember from the broadcast is they were talking about how many times they'd have to shift gears. And it was an insane number. <laughs> I forget what it was, yeah. but it was like, it's been like 1,400 shifts or something for the entire race, which, okay, we've all driven manual transmissions. Most likely our listeners have all driven manuals. Imagine how many times you shift in like a 90-minute commute where you're in stop and go in your first, second, maybe third gear. And then think about doing that at speed where you're on the throttle, full throttle or, or heavy throttle, then on the brakes, up and down through the gears. I forget what, I, I'm not sure what gears, what gear they'd be using in Martinsville, probably third and fourth, I would imagine. Um, just, just kind of spitballing here, but imagine up just shifting up and down, up and down two, three times a lap, you know what I mean? And, and, and how tiring it is. And I think one thing that a lot of sports fans, particularly fans who don't follow racing closely, don't understand is how physically demanding it is being in that car. And I don't even think we as fans of racing can really fully understand it. It's hard to understand unless you've done it. And most of us have not done it at that level. Now, if you if you've done it at a low level, like dirt track racing that you do on a Saturday night, and you pour a few hundred bucks into an old hoopty and race it, you might get a sense, you might get a taste of it. Anyone who's done a Richard Petty experience, which I have, you get a sense of it of how physically demanding it is. But you don't really understand it unless you're a professional driver with thirty other drivers out there for three to four hours, uh, no food breaks, no bathroom breaks. And and those cars, you know, they, they don't have power. I don't think they have power steering. I'm pretty sure they don't have power brakes. So it's, and even if they did have power steering and power brakes, which some racing cars do, it's still physically demanding. So I think that's the other interesting part about Martinsville is how much demand it puts. So how much demand it puts on the car and how much demand it puts on the driver. So I think even if the racing itself looks a little boring, that aspect of it is one reason why I tune into short track races. And there's a whole host of different skills, right, for the different tracks. And I don't care. I mean, some people were complaining when they brought out the sequential transmission uh, recently instead of the H pattern um, stick shift, right? And But mm-hmm. it's still, you still need to know when to shift. You're still actively operating that shifter, like you said, thousands of times during the race. And yeah. I think it's still, it still um, adds to the difficulty of driving one of these beasts around. This is not exactly a light car. You still got to wrangle this thing around the track, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I agree. I agree. So, I mean, if, if, if NASCAR can 
find a few more horsepower down in the in the couch cushions at Daytona. Well, you know, that, that'll that help a lot, too. So it'll certainly add to the levity of it. Yeah, excellent. So, Matthew, thank you again for your time talking about NASCAR and, and our other segment stuff we use. This has been our our little uh, NASCAR chat here in the Truth About Cars with Matthew Guy. Matthew, thank you for your time. And we will be right back on the Truth About Cars podcast. eBay Motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love. You transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Motors Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and exclusions apply. We thank Cody Stoley and Matthew Guy for their time, and we thank you for listening. You can find us at ttac.com, that's T-T-A-C.com, or The Truth About Cars, all spelled out, thetruthaboutcars.com. I'm Tim Healy, the managing editor for The Truth About Cars, and we will see you next time.